Well, good morning from Wellington, and uh, not very warm, but at least it's sunny. So, what's my message today? It's real short. It's about our topic coming on Saturday, which is the entire book of Nahum. We're going to do the entire book in one go, but before you panic, Nahum is only three chapters long and the chapters are all really short. One of the shortest books in the Bible. But why Nahum? So the reason I'm wanting to put this message up today, so I know not everyone can tune and watch it live, I know everyone's lives are busy, so is mine. The, the reality is though, we live in a time where if we don't pay attention to what God is saying, we will perish. Simple as that. If anyone thinks they can outsmart Satan without God's help, they're delusional. And we see a lot of delusion in our world right now. Our, well, several weeks, our men's Bible study has been getting a really clear message from God and all the scriptures he points to even when we don't plan, even when individuals just bring what God has said to them during the week, it turns out to be the same message, so that we know it's from Him, that we haven't given a message and told everyone, go away and study this, it's the other way around, it's God has given each of us a message to bring back, and all the messages collide at one inescapable conclusion. What's that conclusion? summarized best from Jeremiah 9 it's that the rich man should not boast of his riches or the strong man of his strength or a wise man of his wisdom the only thing that will count for a bean the only thing that will matter at all the only thing that's legitimate to boast about is if you can have the understanding to know me says God what does that mean well, there's so many false Christs in the world, so many false teachers, so many false prophets. When God says to have the understanding to know me, in Greek, know is this word um, epinosis, and it, and it means not just know, like I know Paris exists, but I've never been there. I have no experience of Paris. I only have what other people have said about it to go on. I've no personal experience of Paris. Epinosis is the opposite of that. Epinosis is where you strive to know him through studying his word, because his word reveals him. Faith comes through hearing the word of God. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's not speculation. It's not trying to have enough trust. It's the result of studying the Word of God according to the Word of God, that's the facts. And it, I tell you, from, it's true. My own experience is that. 2 Thessalonians 2 makes it plain that because they refuse to love the truth, Jesus is the truth. He's the Word of God. If you don't love the truth, you don't love the Word, you don't love Him, no matter what you say. You can say you love Jesus all you like. But if you don't love what the scripture actually says and cling to it, which is what John 14 means when it says, the one that loves me is the one that keeps my commands. Of course, originally it's in Greek. It's a better translation would be the one that loves me is the one that loves what I've said and clings tightly to it and won't let anyone take it away from them. But they jealously guard the truth in their own lives and walk by it. That's what that means. So all these things are different ways of saying the same basic thing. That the time is coming, and is probably here. But what God says in 2 Thessalonians 2 is actually happening all around us. That God is sending a powerful delusion. A delusion is like a mental illness. where And you see it everywhere. You've got people, even scientists, trying to tell you that there can be more than two sexes. People who want to be taken seriously trying to tell you that uh, I think in Europe at a recent conference they, they officially accepted 27 different genders. This is mental illness. This is so far removed from even, even putting the Bible aside for a second. 
from a biological and scientific point of view, it's utter, utter, utter nonsense. It's beyond fairy tale. It's a delusion. But the fact that so many believe it and you can't talk them out of it, they go all misty eyed and disappear when you try and talk to them. It's demonic. It's a delusion. It's judgment. God knows who hates him. God knows who he can bring to repentance and who he cannot. If you haven't watched it already, you need, you really need to watch our study from a couple of weeks ago, What Happens When the Clay Gets Too Hard, from Jeremiah 19. I apologise in advance if you haven't watched it already, that that particular weekend I only had my really clunky old, um, what do you call it, webcam, which is the quality is a bit rubbish, but it doesn't matter, you don't need to see me well to listen well and to have your Bible out and the written studies available. If you don't have it, just email me, just go on my Facebook, message me, whatever you want to do to get the hard copy or be part of the email, just do that. It's free, it doesn't cost you nothing. But you have to understand it because the gist of that is, there's, if you remember the, the story of Jeremiah being sent to the potter's house where he sees the potter, the the workable clay on his wheel starts to go wrong talks about the pot he's making becoming marred it simply means that the pot he's trying to make starts going wrong it's not going to turn out to be a good pot well that's a picture of you before you were saved you were maturing growing up but what you were going to turn into is only good for throwing out right so while the clay can still be changed while it's still malleable enough to be reshaped the potter squashes the clay back down and out of the same lump he makes a new pot and God describes that process as how he's going to treat his people. So everyone growing up in sin and apart from him is like that marred pot. When he saves you, he doesn't fix you. It's a fallacy. God does not repair people. He replaces them. He makes a new pot instead of trying to fix the old one. And that's why we have to take up our cross. The old nature has to die. That's the old clay, that's the old pot getting squashed. But while the clay is still able to be reshaped, he, in his hands, is the master potter. He reshapes that same basic material, who you are, into something worth keeping, the new creation. That's what Jeremiah 18 is all about. But he makes a warning that if people are too stubborn and, too, and won't love the truth and you know, too pig-headed, basically, too self-willed and too selfish in their motivation. They love sin too much. Eventually, the clay becomes too hard to reshape. It dries out and becomes brittle. So Jeremiah 19, which is the lesson that you, like I say, you need to listen to it. He explains to Jeremiah, that, and he does it by a picture. He tells Jeremiah to take a finished pot, so it's been dried out and fired so it's hard like a pot you'd buy in a shop right and he tells them in front of the priests and in front of the elders to throw that down onto the ground in what is essentially the entrance to jerusalem's rubbish pit where the rubbish fires in the valley of ben hinnom in hebrew that's gehenom that became in greek gehenna which you know is in english as hell because the rubbish fires in that valley just outside the, the uh, potter's gate and the walls around Jerusalem, that's where all the rubbish for the whole city was taken out and burned. And so much rubbish meant the fires there never really went out 24-7, day and night, day after day after day. All the rubbish, the stuff that was no longer any use for keeping, was thrown out there. And God says in Jeremiah 19, basically I've had enough. That's it. I'm not going to try and f I'm not going to try and fix this anymore. It's talking about the same thing as Second Second Thessalonians two, where he realizes, where he knows with certainty, and God never makes a mistake. The people that no matter what he does, they are going to absolutely refuse to be conformed to him. They will not agree to be. The, for their old nature to be squashed and to be made into a new creation fit for heaven. 
Eventually, they become so hardened, like a hard-hearted or stiff-necked, as the Bible talks about, that they become impossible to change. The disciples, referring to the Pharisees who, to the end, were chasing after Jesus, they said to Jesus, what about them? You know what Jesus said to them? He says, leave them. They are self-condemned. Not that he condemned them, they condemned themselves. How? By their refusal to be corrected by the truth. Remember what 2 Thessalonians says, because they refuse to love the truth, God sends, God sends this delusion upon them. And that delusion puts them in the hand of Antichrist. The, the mark of the beast, they can't avoid receiving it because God hands them over to it. The mark of the beast is just the evidence that they are handed over. They won't have any choice. None. The, the, the loss, the condemnation of their lives, the, the consigning themselves to hell, came before, way before, when they refused to be corrected by thy word, when they refused to love the truth. So right now, God is testing the entire earth by causing the ridiculous and the insane to be promoted as sanity. Things like the gender argument, that you can be whatever gender you'd like, that it's not just male and female. People think this is about human rights. It's got nothing to do with human rights at all. This is a direct test from God. A satanic attack on the fundamental truth of the Bible. The fundamental truth of science as it happens. Will you stand, even though it's unpopular, Will you stand for what is true or to gain the acceptance and favour of the fallen world, will you go along with the delusion? Remember what Jesus said in John 14, the one that loves me keeps my word, meaning will not allow themselves to be parted from my word, will cling to my word as more important than oxygen, that the truth is far more important than whether you're popular with the world. Jesus said the world will hate his disciples, and it does. It's a big decision for people to make, but as Joshua said when they entered into the land, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's not a game, it's really serious. So anyway, back to what God has been telling us in the men's group, and ironically, the women have had the same experience different message but the same experience God's been pressing us to not buy in and to not be lured or seduced by any other agenda to put as the priority the priority to know him and to walk according to his example Christ to believe him and not the world even if that makes us unpopular and to be men to be men because when you attack the like I say people try and make this a human rights issue that's just part of the delusion the reality is if you dismiss God's order I should I should say first that one of the things that God has brought back to mind for the woman is the issue of headship that Christ is head over the church at just and the husband head over his wife or a father over his daughter this order of God's kingdom headship and that the woman needs to be feminine a woman a godly woman and that us guys he's calling on us uh, there's another scripture but I don't want to go to it because I know that the young ones are planning to teach on it themselves so I don't want to steal their thunder I'll leave that for them but just in summary, God's basically telling the men, you have to be men. Like, not something vague or ambiguous. You have to be men. Christian men. The men have to be men, and the women have to be women, and the order of his kingdom is what he expects of us. Right? So all this gender stuff going on is a direct... People will say, oh, it's Satan attacking... Yes, it's Satan, but it's Satan doing God's bidding. 
God is testing the whole earth to see who will stand for him and who will flake and be so unloyal, so self-interested that they'll put, you know, gaining the approval of the fallen world around them is more important than, God, than having God's approval. Because remember, if you stand for the Lord, you're going to suffer at the hands of the wicked. They are not going to like you. They will actively hate you. There's people experiencing all kinds of astonishingly wicked things at the moment because they just say no. Like a 13-year-old schoolgirl in England who stood up to her teacher because the teacher insisted in the class and the teacher didn't know she's recording it right on her phone so that's gone viral on the internet. He insisted that she respect the fact that her classmate identified as a cat and he insisted that he treat her as a cat out of respect for her. This is a teacher influencing a 13 year old, maybe your, maybe your daughter, right? This is insanity, absolute insanity. But she was almost expelled from her school because she wouldn't back down. She stood her ground, right? Well, thankfully, half the world now is, has her back and she knows that she was absolutely right to stand up to this lunatic. But that's the school, right? And it's happening in schools across the whole world, all sorts of stuff. It's a direct assault on God's order, but God has sent it because it forces us off the fence. Sorry, that's a very English phrase for you Filipinos. It's, it forces us from being lukewarm. We have to decide. If you don't stand for something, you stand for nothing. If you accept everything, you stand for nothing. If you are tolerant of everything, then you stand for nothing. And if you stand for nothing, you might as well not exist. You might as well just stop breathing. You certainly don't stand for Christ if you stand for nothing. Right? God is not going, remember what he says, I wish you were either hot or cold, but since you are lukewarm, I want to spew you out of my mouth. Scripture. God talking. Jesus talking. Not a joke. So anyway, Jeremiah 19 is coming. God has had enough. He is going to do to the world, starting in the churches, because remember judgment begins in the house of God. Why? Because we have the least excuse. The world has some kind of excuse of ignorance, but the church has none, because we profess to know, right? So it's, this message is more urgent for the church than it is for the world, but the world must listen as well or perish. But this weekend we're going to talk about the message of Nahum. What happens in Jeremiah, the next chapter in fact, after Jeremiah throws this pot down. The thing about throwing a, a finished pot down is because it's hard, when it hits the ground it shatters and as God says in that chapter, it becomes beyond repair. It's at the rubbish gate. It's, it's a signifying that when when people or a nation or indeed the whole creation reaches a point where it's beyond fixing it's beyond making into anything it's like that pot that's only good for taking to the potter's gate and throwing out into Gehenna the, the where the rubbish fires of his holy place outside the city walls that means excluded from his presence it's a picture of hell it's a picture of the lake of fire, right? He's talking about final judgment. And once that happens, there's no, there's no going back. It's beyond repentance. It's beyond salvation. It's final. When God throws the rubbish into the fire, it can never come back. Do you think this might be urgent? Oh, yes. But in Jeremiah... What happened next is what Jeremiah had been told to warn happened, and that is wicked Judah, though the tribe in charge of the temple in, in uh, Jerusalem that had followed the sins of the ten tribes who'd already gone into exile in Assyria. God sent Babylon 
to take them into exile and to destroy the temple and to destroy the city. This is historic, right? It's really happened. And the the reason you know God did it is when he destroyed this temple the second time in AD 70, it happened on the exact same calendar day, the ninth of the month of Av. Exact same day. Hundreds of years later, when God destroyed the second temple, the one Jesus walked in, he chose the exact same day so that they would understand it wasn't random, it was God that did it. Judgment. So this time, when Jeremiah 19 happens, you know that what happens next is Babylon comes. Babylon is a picture of the kingdom of Antichrist. The book of Revelation refers to it as Babylon the Great. Right? The Great because the first one only affected the Jews and Jerusalem. The second, Bab the Antichrist, is global. Hence Babylon the Great. The original Babylon is just like a movie trailer, you know? It teaches us something about what's going to happen in the future by revealing what happened in the past. But before Babylon is fully strong enough to conquer Judah, which Assyria had never been able to do because God would not permit it, the first thing that God uses Babylon for is to destroy Assyria, the wicked empire that had taken the ten tribes into captivity, and totally corrupted them in, the, in sexual immorality and witchcraft, which are the hallmarks of the Assyrian gods. It's because the two tribes that he originally saved turned and did the same things and adopted the same practices that he, Babylon comes. Cut a long story short, Assyria, for us, the spiritual version of Assyria, came in the 1990s, most famously in the form of the Toronto laughing they called it a blessing, a revival. It wasn't. It's absolutely demonic. That has grown and manifested into what today is the new apostolic reformation and dominionism. The things you always hear me going on about. Warning, 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 because it's demonic. And it's in the churches everywhere. If you still listen to Bethel, if you still listen to Hillsong, you're in huge trouble. If you listen to any of those prosperity teachers, the Joseph Prince's, or the, um, you know, any of those, Kenneth Copeland, or any of, it's all part of Assyria, right? Before Babylon came, God destroyed the Assyrian Empire. The capital of the Assyrian Empire was Nineveh, the same Nineveh Jonah was sent to. It was so utterly destroyed, it took until the 18th century before they found any trace of it. Archaeologists. They almost thought it was a, a myth that maybe it didn't exist, but they found it. And they found in its records confirmation of everything it said in the Bible, that the Bible record was correct. So now, because everything that happened to the Jews is, was given to us for our instruction, according to the scripture, so what happened, past tense, points to what is going to happen. That means Assyria, before Babylon, Antichrist, has, comes. The first thing God will do is destroy the modern equivalent of Assyria. The good thing is, he sent a prophet to t say what was going to happen first, and that's Nahum, who we're going to study. To understand what it all means, means you need to understand what we're going to talk about on Saturday. So I'm going to... Um, I'm going to trust that for your sake and for the sake of the people you love, especially if you're in leadership, that you either tune in live or tune in later or go to our YouTube channel in the, in the week following where it'll be up as a YouTube clip, along with the written study. Because if you don't understand in advance when it starts to happen, you could easily lose your faith, you could easily misunderstand what's happening and think that God has either abandoned us or doesn't exist. Do you want to go to heaven or hell? It's pretty simple. Are you doing something more important than saving your life? Is there something more important than your eternal fate? Tell me what that is.
I'll be interested to know. Remember what he said to us, the wise man should not boast of his wisdom, the wealthy should not boast of their wealth, a strong man should not boast of their strength, but the one who boasts should only boast of this, that they have the understanding to know me. So that's it for now. Oh, one quick note, we are going, we are about to experiment with changing from Saturday night to Sunday morning, which means that most of you won't be able to watch us live unless you're not going, don't have a fellowship anywhere at the present. So, you know, you're always able to go back and watch it the following day or whatever, we'll, we'll make more use of the YouTube version, the, YouTube, the ARC YouTube channel. We can watch it at your leisure. We, we only provide this for your benefit. We don't want your money. We don't want your membership. God put you in the church you're in for a reason. If you were meant to be in this one, you'd be here. But since you're not here, pretty confident you're where you're supposed to be. So we're supposed to look after the whole body. We should be concerned for every body part, wherever they are, whether they're your friend or your enemy, it doesn't make any difference. Therefore, let's be sure to understand that the, the things God gives us to share with you are for your benefit, not ours. He gives them to us directly for our benefit. We don't need anything back from you there's no bill coming. There's no, yeah, there's no other agenda. We don't want you to go to hell. We absolutely don't want you to miss out on what Jesus paid for on the cross by falling into the deception that is right this minute swallowing up the world. The delusion that God said he would send, what's happening in the world now fits the description. So is this the absolute end? No one knows that. But what we can say with 100% certainty is that it's either the real thing or it's an extraordinarily good dress rehearsal. But since you can't be sure which it is, you better respond as if you knew for certain that this is it. Like I said, if you think there's something more important that you need to be doing, no, there isn't. Okay, that's it for me for now. Hopefully see you online on Saturday or in person. And as I say, within a few weeks we'll be shifting to Sunday mornings. We'll still be broadcasting for those who can get that, we think, maybe. Or else we, we may just record it and then post it after. I'm not quite entirely sure yet. But, you know, as God wills it, that's what we'll do. Okay, shalom.